Welcome to Encounter, where we celebrate putting faith into action and community leaders who live out compassion, grace, and love. We're a program of the Broome County Council of Churches that addresses food insecurity through chow and the Greater Good Grocery, provides hospital and jail ministry, builds wheelchair ramps, and assists neighbors with transportation and shopping services through Faith in Action volunteers. We invite you to the conversation, Encounter Your Neighbors, as we learn to walk together in love and kindness. Good morning, I'm Jeff Kellum, your personable host for the Encounter program. Um, recently, my wife and I went uh, on a hike through Oakley Corners State Forest, and uh, one of the people on the hike with us looked down at her feet and said, you know, I'm, I'm walking through the snow, being careful to, to pick up my feet and not trip over uh, bits of ice or bits of uh, roots and so on. She said, I realize there's beauty around us. And we realized it's a good thing every once in a while, when you're of a certain age, to stop walking and paying attention to what the path is and just stop and kind of look around. Take a look at the great outdoors and uh, see and hear what nature is, is saying to us and how it calms us and so on. And my guest today is Rick Marcy, whose column, coincidentally, <laughs> well, not coincidentally, it's called The Great Outdoors. It's in the uh, Binghamton Press and Sun Bulletin every Sunday in the Do It section, Correct. I believe. So it's right on the back of the, uh, of the crossword puzzle. Uh, Rick is an author, naturalist, and uh, a longtime newspaper reporter for the, for the press. Correct. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I've been reading your column for you know, a long time, and uh, the, the column of a couple of weeks ago about the, the chickadees and about you walk outside and, and you are freed from the cares not only of the world news but your personal issues. Tell me how that came to be. What, what inspired that column? This winter I've spent a lot of time in the forest. I, I'm fortunate. I, I live surrounded by forest and have for 43 years in the same log house so I the forest is 30 yards away from yeah. me and I can't see any other houses so it's uh, it's, it's a common practice uh, for me and especially this winter uh, to go out and uh, I have out I have an ATV uh, one of these drive around things and I drive to a spot in the woods a different spot and I turn it off and then I just sit <laughs> and uh, I especially enjoy looking up because the trees in my woods are big, yeah. mostly well, red oaks, white oaks, red maples, and some stately white pines that are probably 60, 70 feet tall. So this is old growth. It's old, it's, yeah. it's, 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 these are old trees, beautiful trees. They're you know, 24 inches in diameter, oh. and they're 60 feet tall. Yeah. And in the winter... There are no leaves on the trees, so you can look up, and you're looking up these giant columns, and then at the crowns are spreading, and then of late, we've had sparkling blue sky, mm. and uh, I don't really think a lot. I just drink it in ah, yeah. and uh, look around and see what I see. Maybe there are tracks, you know, uh, field mouse tracks or gray fox. I just drink it in and <clears throat> realize that right now, anyway, I'm part of this thing. Yeah. You know, I'm not. <clears throat> I'm not any be better or worse or bigger or smaller. I'm just a part of this very large, yeah. you know, world of nature that uh, is very, very calming yeah. under those circumstances. And you, you tied this to uh, the chickadees. Now, why the chickadees and not the woodpecker or? <clears throat> or well, the. Uh, it, my, I was trying to make a, a kind of a point that the, the world of nature, for the most part, uh, animals are, are kind of indifferent to human endeavors. Granted, we have altered their environment tremendously, and they do have to adapt to human activity. But for the most part, they're driven by instinct. They do the same thing 
They're on a sort of a DNA highway, and chickadees are like that. Uh, they're all they all look alike. <laughs> they're so different from people. I guess was yeah. my point. We are yeah. we're a mishmash. We we we're brilliant and we're stupid. We're <laughs> inspired and we're lazy. You know, we come in a million different colors. We speak a million different languages. But chickadees, yeah. you've seen one chickadee, you know what the next chickadee is going to be like. And that was my sort of right. comparison. Right. I thought everybody knows a chickadee, yeah. and uh, they are. They're, 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 they, they personify energy and brightness, and so that was my, that was my spark bird, my, wow. my, my, my example of. Uh, is the spark bird, uh, is that the first one? What, what's the word for the first bird that you encounter? Uh, spark bird in, in, in the birder community means, and almost every person who enjoys birds, even at a, at a lower level, has a bird that was the first one, yeah. the first one that got them excited about birds. And so just about everybody you talk to, if you go to a place where people are watching birds or a nature center, so everybody will have their spark bird, that right. first bird. Right. For my son, my son is an ornithologist, as I've shared with you, and his, uh, I think in his doctoral thesis was something about mating uh, and downy woodpeckers mating habits or something in downy woodpeckers. And uh, he's been fascinated by woodpeckers for ages. And of course, we now know the difference between a downy and a hairy and, and so on. Um, and the bird feeders are up. Um, you must have bird feeders around your house. I'm surrounded by them. Yeah. So uh, what are you putting in your feeders? Uh, uh, is it mostly sunflower seeds? I have the I have hopper, hopper feeders, which are... are have a roof and two two glassed sides or plastic sides, and you can pour a good scoop yeah. of sunflower seeds into them, and you if you know last four or five days. But they also have suet cages on either side, so right. I buy these cakes of suet, which is like rendered fat with mixed with nuts and seeds. That attracts the woodpeckers, but also nuthatches and chickadees and titmice and this. Sunflower seeds get, get cardinals and other birds. Yeah. So. I was thinking of the, the suet. Um, man, the price of the suet has gone up. <laughs> well, during, you know, during that, when we had that big uh, push of inflation two or three years ago, everything, everything went up, yeah. including sunflower seeds and, and the suet. But it used to be I could buy it for about a buck a cake, and now it's, you know. A bunch. Well, back in the day. <laughs> When I was a young whippersnapper, and my mother was a wonderful naturalist in the 50s and 60s around the Binghamton area, she would go to the Mohegan Market, which was a, a, a market on Shenango Street in Binghamton, old style. It had uh, sawdust on the floor. Wow. And she would go to the meat department, and she would ask the butcher, do you have any suet? And he would say, oh, are you one of them bird watchers? And she proudly said, yes, I am. And he says, just hold on a second. He would come back with, you know, a bag of it and say, it's all yours. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> oh, yeah, it, it's just when spring comes and the birds kind of start returning to our yard, cost, I mean, I have to go out there every day and refill. refill it's worth stuff. it. Yeah. Oh, it, I, it, it is. is it's, I get so much pleasure yeah. out of it. So what, what moved you into uh, being a naturalist? What did you study this in college, uh, or is this something that you came to later in life? I grew up with Harriet Marcy, and Harriet Marcy was a, a, a super naturalist. Uh, uh, before naturalists were known yeah. outside of a very few people, and the, and the word environment hadn't been invented yet, she was in love with all things natural. And... Uh, she was an avid birder. She raised bees. She banded birds. And I lived with her, you know. Yeah. I was a kid in this house, and as a kid, I could care less about all this stuff. Uh, and that, that lasted right pretty much through college. Mm. And uh, at, some, at, at some point, I realized that uh, through osmosis, I had, I had learned a, a, a remarkable amount about natural history in general. And so yeah. when I got to be in my mid-20s, all of a sudden I just fell head over heels for the whole thing. And 
she lived on land <clears throat> that I could explore and as, an, as a young adult, and that's how it really took off. Right. So uh, you were a, a columnist, well, no, you were a reporter for the local newspaper, but wrote this column even then. Mm -hmm. uh, so was your, was your major, you went to Colgate. I was did. your major in journalism or? It was in economics. Ah. In... <laughs> How'd that serve you? <laughs> well, uh, I went to Colgate mm -hmm. and I loved my experience there. Right. So uh, the fact that uh, I did not go on to, to uh, exploit my, my degree makes me just like a million other people who went to <laughs> college and studied something yeah. and found something completely different that, right. that they fell in love with. Right. So no regrets. I understand. You know, spring is coming, and um, we're, we're emerging now from the, the darkness of winter, and uh, later this month, spring arrives. Uh, and I know the first sign in our yard is usually the crocuses popping up through the, the hardened earth. And I always go out and take pictures. I've taken pictures of the same stupid crocus year after year after year. Welcome to the club. <laughs> but there's something there that says you've got to capture this. What are some of the other things that we should be aware of as spring comes? Um, just, I, I'll just well, throw that out and let that sure. be your question. Sure. Um, right now, uh, I'm, I'm fortunate that uh, when I wake up in the morning, <clears throat> I'm looking east through some fairly large windows through the forest, and I live on a hill, so I, I look, I wake up and I look into the trees, and then I look up the slope, and there's the horizon, mm -hmm. and I can see the horizon because the trees are bare. And this morning, I got up at seven o'clock, and uh, already I could start to see the glow uh, of yeah. the sunrise, and I th and I thought, wow, uh, the the solstice is two months past. December 21st, and the equinox is only a month away. Yeah. And the sun, of course, doesn't move. <laughs> we move, but we see the sun as moving. And as I wake up and spring approaches, that sun is creeping, creeping, creeping farther away from the south, and I can watch it. Yeah. And, I can, I, and I know it's coming very shortly. I, I think of March 1st. I really, I really crank up the motor and start looking for the earliest robins, for example, mm. come back. Sometimes they come back and uh, they get snowed on, you know, 12 inches of snow, but they survive. Uh, I start looking for, obviously, the first skeins of Canada geese, the wild geese mm -hmm. that have spent the winter maybe on the Delmarva Peninsula, Chesapeake Bay, sometime. we get a, north, get a beautiful southerly breeze. This could happen any time from... from from late February on, you get a southerly breeze, and that's a tailwind for these birds, and they will come streaming back, yeah. flying overhead. And I always wonder where do they where did they take off from this morning? Was it was it uh, Delaware Bay, and where are they headed? Maybe Cayuga Lake. So I start looking for all sorts of migratory birds, and yeah. of course, then the first wildflowers start popping up, and it becomes a real cavalcade after that. We have a, a wetland behind our, our house, and uh, boy, the, the, the geese are, uh, w what a ruckus. I mean, it's just, it's sometimes overwhelming. And then in the summertime, we hear the uh, coyotes in the, in the, the hills behind mm -hmm. that, that wetland. So the idea of, of actually listening to nature, as well as seeing, I think primarily we're, we're looking at things, but... Uh, the idea that, that nature makes sounds is, is, is wonderful. I, I mean, just the buzzing of a bee, for heaven's sake. Um, all, of the, all of the emotions and feelings and so on are, are tied with this, this renewal of, of life coming back. Which is Hearing and listening are so crucial. Uh, I'm blessed with really a good hearing. Yeah. And uh, I use it constantly. I'm, I, I'm constantly listening when I'm outside because it gives you so many hints as to what's there. Yeah. And f <clears throat> while I was, when I was starting to l uh, learn the songs of the birds, I would, I would tune in and I'd hear the birds and, and uh, then try to find them and watch 
actually watch their beaks opening and the song coming out, and then I could say, okay, I know that bird makes that sound. Yeah. And, it was the, and it was hearing. Then I started taking people on guided walks, which I've done hundreds and hundreds of them. And back then, there was no uh, Merlin app. There's an app now from the <laughs> Cornell Lab of Ornithology. It's unbelievable on your phone, and everybody should get it. It's free, and you basically turn it on, and it starts listening for birds, recording. Yeah. And it's very sensitive. And when a chickadee calls, it goes black cap chickadee. It <laughs> pops out yellow, you know. And then, then the cardinal calls and pops out. It, it tells you what bird is singing, and it highlights yeah. that particular bird. 30 years ago, that didn't exist. And I found that uh, I, I was the only one in, practically in Broome County who could tell you... <laughs> every bird that we were, we were hearing uh, in the woods. And one of the reasons that was, was that people weren't listening. Yeah, yeah. And I would discover on the walks, I'd have to say, here's the deal. You can talk, but not, not loudly. Mm -hmm. And the quieter you are, the more you will hear. Yeah. And the slower you walk, the more you will see. Mm -hmm. And those two things were harder than you might think for people to grasp and, and undertake. Sure. Because I remember uh, on one occasion, a wonderful woman, she was a psychology professor at Binghamton University, high-powered job. And uh, she, she signed up for one of my birding classes that went for six or seven weeks. And the first class that we came to... Uh, I had forgotten to give my my uh, Your introductory a, speech. A couple of <laughs> tips in the beginning, and one of them was, "Stay behind me." Mm. Yeah. That that that'll slow you right down. Yeah. And I had forgotten to say that, and her and her first instinct was, "This is a bird class. Let's go." Yeah. And she just started, you know, tr you know, full speed ahead, and I had to say, <laughs> "Linda, please come back." And after that, every week she would go. She would come to the class and go, okay, this is Rick Marcy time. Rick Marcy time. Yeah. You know, she had to tell herself. <laughs> Take a breath. To slow down. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're on, on our way to do things. We've got to get there. Yeah. Um, Joan and I have walked trails. Jo one of the, my wife's favorite things to do is to, to walk in the woods. And uh, um, we've been on trails in the Canadian Rockies and, and in Scotland and Ireland and there's always this group that's walking w way too fast and making a lot of noise, chattering, you mm -hmm. know, or, or maybe they're looking at their phones. And, you know, we want to be there. The only noise we want to make is if, if there's bears, we want to clap our hands a few times. But other than that, you want to just take your time, you know. If you don't get to the very top, and, man, we could tell you some stories there, too, of, of climbing up. And, you know, you think we're got about to give up and the group is coming down. You're saying, how much further? And they say, oh, about 10 minutes. So you go on a bit further and further and further. And the next group comes down. How much further to the top? Oh, about 10 minutes. <laughs> so you're always 10 minutes from, from the top. Anyway, uh, our, our guest today is, is Rick Marcy. And uh, he's the columnist in the Richmond and the... Uh, Binghamton newspaper. I still got Richmond in my head. I don't. I don't know. Uh, the Great Outdoors is the name of the column, and we're talking about um, about the Great Outdoors. What are your fa favorite places to explore besides your yard? We're blessed in this area to have s so many beautiful public places where <clears throat> you can enjoy the outdoors. <clears throat> Just to, the county parks, for starters, uh, Greenwood Park in a uh, town in Anacoke, 400 plus acres, miles of trails, 25 acre lake. Uh, I, I worked at the Broome County Parks Department for many, many years as a naturalist and took hundreds and hundreds of kids there. It's a beautiful park mm -hmm. still. Um, Coal Park in uh, 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 Colesville, same scene, 50 acre lake, a beautiful wooded trail around the lake and uh, shaded by hemlocks where you, can, where you can hear brown creepers singing in the spring and you can see t two or three different types of trillium. That's a beautiful place. Upper Lyle Park, 
north of Whitney Point. You're, you're at the, the confluence of the Osceolic River flowing into the Whitney Point Lake, and there's a big wetland next to you. You've got water in three different forms that you yeah. can enjoy if you're a kayaker. Jones Park, which is a town of Vestal Park, hundreds and hundreds of wooded acres where you can walk on a trail and see pink, uh, pink, uh, pink lady slippers mm. in the spring. Um, the list goes on. Waterman Center in Appalachian yep. is a beautiful opportunity for forest walks. There are just so many places. Yeah. Uh, we are, uh, I mentioned the, uh, the state forest and uh, Oakley Corners is where we were m most recently. And there was another one up north of Ithaca too that uh, when we lived in Trumansburg, we used to we used to go up there. Um, seeking out these new places is really fun. You, you, there is a sense of familiarity if you're on a, a trail you know well. There's some advantages mm -hmm. to that. But following the blazes on the trees and, and taking a different trail each time, following trail number one or trail number six or whatever, just just be open to exploring. Absolutely. These days with your cell phone, you can hardly get lost. You know, the GPS will always help you find your way home. So uh, we gave our son uh, your book on, uh, was it The Wetlands? Um, a, a, a lovely book mm -hmm. with a spiral bind, binding. And But you have a new book coming out, right? Yeah. What's the, the book that's out now that you're referring to is called For the Love of Wetlands. Yeah. And I mentioned Upper Lyle Park. I was a naturalist for the county parks department, and this would be in the mid-70s. And uh, one of my jobs was to go to Upper Lyle Park, where there was a campground at the time, and uh, show a nature movie on Friday evenings. There was an outdoor screen to the campers. So I went up there and uh, the first time and realized, wow, this campground is separated uh, by one small little dirt road from a beautiful big wetland. Mm. And so I made a point of going up there early on Friday evening so I could hang out at the wetland before I, I gave the program. Beautiful, and I fell in love with this wetland. And I started going there regularly, taking notes about what I saw. When I left the parks department, I kept going back. And I realized a couple of years ago, I've been going to this place for 45 or 50 years constantly, and I had a voluminous amount of diary entries. Right. So my wife, Jan, who's a great illustrator, and I put together sort of like an annual from the minute the ice melts in late February to the ice out, ice in late November, we did a kind of a daily diary of encounters. Yeah, yeah. And uh, with photos, by me because I take photographs and text and my wife's illustrations. Yeah. The new book will be a sequel for the love of forests. Mm -hmm. Basically the same premise, uh, but this will be year round because the forest doesn't freeze up and you know die. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> they go That's to sleep yeah. for, for yeah. three months. So yeah. that'll be coming out probably by Thanksgiving. Yeah. You know, I've, we've lived, Joan and I have lived in, in primarily three different areas. We. We lived in Virginia for 27 years. Springtime in Virginia, with its dogwoods and its azaleas, it's just beautiful. Then we moved to Vermont. Vermont, um, when spring comes, basically that's a matter of green. Just it, it almost overnight greens up. Um, the snow is gone. The maybe four feet of snow sometimes. Um, and now in New York State, it's a you know, now that we've moved back here, uh, we're, we're discovering springtime and, and it's various, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, the environmental miracle of, of springtime that, that happens. So walking in some of these favorite places of yours uh, is going to be inspiring, I think, for a lot of folks to think about just going out and again, we've talked about looking and we've talked about listening and uh, touching, uh, you know, to, to touch those tender new leaves mm -hmm. that are coming out of the tree, or the, the needles that are, are pliable now and not hard and, and brittle. Uh, all these feelings come together, and, and what a wonderful career you've had 
in helping us discover that week by week in the, in the column. Yeah, speaking of touching, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I recommend everyone become a tree hugger. I love hugging trees, and the bigger the better. Yeah. There is a, a sycamore, an American sycamore. That's a tree that grows along, oftentimes along rivers. It has a smooth, pale green bark that peels. Yeah. They're, they're like potato chip, sort of uh, tan, peely part, parts of the bark uh, with this base of a smooth gray. They're beautiful trees, and as you park at the beach parking lot at Shenango Valley State Park, and you start walking toward the Towpath Trail, which is a beautiful trail to walk on right by the Shenango River, you will encounter a sycamore that must be four or five feet across at the base. It is just a monarch. Mm. And that's your tree hugging tree there. And yeah. I have photo documentation of myself trying to wrap myself <laughs> around that and not even, not even getting halfway. Right, yeah, touching right. and tactile is wonderful. Another uh, way to really connect with terra firma, and I know that as you get older, this gets harder to do, but I still do it, is, and I do, do it in the winter too, is to lie on your back mm. under big trees yeah. and look straight up. Yeah. And uh, talk about inspiration and shutting yourself up and just watching and looking. I get a thrill out of that. Yeah. And you, these, these uh, phones we have now take wonderful pictures. Mm -hmm. So I'll just lie on my back and I love, especially under big white pines because there you get I think I may have mentioned in the winter, they're still green and they have yeah. five inch long needles. Yeah. So you're looking up at these beautiful, huge tall trunks and then you have these sprays of leaves and against the blue sky, yeah. it's exciting stuff. Yeah. Um, the, just the idea of being still for a while, you know, we've, again, uh, to go back to what we were talking about earlier, we are so much on the way someplace, we have to accomplish so much. But just lying down in the grass or, or lying down in the forest looking up. Or just sitting in your backyard, quiet. Yeah. Yeah. Don't move and quiet. You're, you disappear. Yeah. The animals don't know, well, there's a person. Yeah. You're just a stump. Yeah. And you'll see stuff coming to you instead of fleeing from you. Right, right. Well, uh, thank you so much. I, I told you this half hour would fly by, and, and it, it has. Uh, our guest today has been Rick Marcy, who writes... The newspaper column, The Great Outdoors, look for it today in the Press and Sun Bulletin, either the print edition, which I get on Sundays, or, or online, and read Rick's um, most recent column, and then look forward to his books coming out as well. You can find them at the Waterman Center Library uh, or Book uh, Center, which is where we, we find them. So Rick Marcy has been our guest, and I thank you for joining us for the Encounter Program. It's produced in cooperation with the Broome County Council of Churches, Exploring God's Nature, and um, we have to thank WBNG-TV for the production facilities and the Town Square Media Stations for playing the audio portion of our program. I'm Jeff Kellum, Parish Associate at the Union Presbyterian Church in Endicott, hoping that in the coming week you'll be gentle with people and with yourself.